51st lecture and our topic of today would be network transmission criteria. Before we go into this a few words about the bridged T network, the constant resistance network that we discussed as one of the examples. Well, you recall that the bridge T network is like this, you have two resistances and an impedance here Z B and an impedance here Z A, the resistances are R and this is a constant resistance bridged T network which means that if either of the ports is terminated in a resistance R, then the input impedance looking at the other port is R. The network is symmetrical and therefore either port terminated in R shall give you an input resistance of R and if this voltage is V2 and this is connected to a voltage generator V1, then V2 by V1 is equal to 1 by 1 plus Z A divided by R which is the same as 1 plus R divided by Z B because the, the condition for constant resistance network is that Z A Z B should be equal to R squared. This is the main result. Sir, how do you know here? Sir, this uh, resistance R which is inside the network. Correct. Sir, is that equal to the terminating resistance? Correct they have to be identical yes, they have to be identical ok. This is the main result and you can prove this I think part of it we proved. What you want to do is to illustrate this with an example <coughs> uh, and as I said constant resistance networks are most useful in cascade synthesis that is break up the given transfer function into component ones, simpler ones and realize each simpler transfer function by a constant resistance network then cascade networks. That is what you do is you have a network N1, you have a network N2 both of which are constant resistance and then terminate by R ok. Drive it by voltage source V1 if this is V2 and if this is V3 then V3 by V1 is equal to V3 by V2 that is the transfer function of this multiplied by V2 by V1 and because the input impedance here is equal to R, the transfer function of N1 is not altered, is not changed when N2 is cascaded to it. This is the beauty of constant resistance networks and they are the answers for the lack of buffered devices like op-amps in passive circuits. The cost that you pay, you have to pay a price for every advantage that you accrue. The cost that you pay is the increased number of elements. It is expansive, constant resistance networks are expansive in the number of elements. And the power losses? Power losses of course. Power loss possibly is not of much concern not of much concern particularly in filtering applications ok. But filter in filtering applications the main concern is frequency filtering it is not power. But if power can be preserved it is a good point it is a plus point alright. Let us take an example. <coughs> Suppose I have to synthesize a transfer function V2 by V1 equals to S squared plus 1 divided by S squared plus 2 S plus 1 times S plus 2 divided by S plus 3 let us say. Okay. Now um, <coughs> by a constant resistance network and the constant the terminating network the terminating resistance given is R equal to 1 ohm alright R equal to 1 ohm. Then what I do is I look upon this as the product of two transfer functions one is this and the other is this and this obviously can be written as 1 plus 2 S divided by S squared plus 1 which means 
that z a for this network this is 1 plus z a by r. So, z a is this z a of the first network whereas, this can be written as 1 over 1 plus 1 by s plus 2. So, z a 2 z a 2 this for the second network it is this and one can now draw the two networks immediately. If you know z a then you know z b also z b sim shall be simply the reciprocal of z a and therefore, our network will now be 1 ohm 1 ohm the input is a voltage source v 1 <coughs> then z a z a is 2 s divided by s squared plus 1 which I can write as s by 2 plus 1 over 2 s this is an impedance this is an impedance so 1 by this must be an admittance in other words we have a capacitor of value half in parallel with inductor of value 2 2 Henry and that is it then what we have here is the reciprocal of z a z b is r squared by z a r is 1 therefore, it is the reciprocal in other words treat this as an impedance that will give you z b which means that we have a half Henry inductor in series with a capacitor of value 2 farads. Okay. This realizes the first transfer function on the on the condition that the termination is 1 ohm right. The condition is that the termination should be 1 ohm instead of 1 ohm we cascade a second network okay. and the second network realizes the transfer function s plus 2 divided by s plus 3 which gives you z a 2 <coughs> equal to 1 over s plus 2 and therefore, I have the second network 1 and 1 these two must be there. Then in parallel I have 1 over s plus 2 which means an, an admittance of value s plus 2 that means a capacitor of value 1 and a resistor of value half. Okay. So, that is it for the second network and as far as this, this arm is concerned z b should be simply equal to s plus 2 which means an inductor of value 1 and a resistance of value 2. The final network is now to be terminated in 1 ohm and this should be V2. This is the complete synthesis. All right. There are difficulties, difficulties. For example, if the transfer function was uh, let us go back to this. <coughs> Suppose the transfer function was s plus 3 over s plus 2 all right s plus 3 over s plus 2 could you have realized this could you have realized the transfer function if it was s plus 3 by s plus 2 can you express this as 1 by 1 plus z a what can you do just a minute just a minute can you express this as 1 by 1 plus z a where z a is a PR function? No. 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 So, but what? instead of taking v 2 by v 1 mm -hmm. we can take v 1 by v 2 and for s plus 2 by s plus 3. We can take v 1 by v 2 that is not what is wanted. So you cannot change the specs. So, but for the second function ah. I mean for the second network. Correct. We can it is symmetrical. <coughs> it is symmetrical fine. So, so, we can inverse that. No, no, no. If you invert the, the transfer function is changed. There is a fundamental reason why you cannot realize this. Can you tell me what the fundamental <coughs> reason is? There is a fundamental reason for which you cannot realize this whatever network you whatever network you attempt. No. It is not a question. Well, <laughs> No, there is no instability s equal to minus 2. The D s, pardon me? 1 plus 1 by s plus 2. 1 plus 1 by s plus 2, okay. Which means that the DC response 
is greater than 1. Can you think of a network which can multiply DC unless it is an amplifier? So, activity is a part of this. This transfer function cannot be realized. So, have a close look at the transfer function before you attempt any of the realizations. It is just a caution. Now, the main topic for today <coughs> is network transmission criteria. Most of the networks, most of the networks and communication channels that you see in practice are low pass structures. That is their high frequency response be, is limited. Okay. So, our discussion shall be concerned with low pass structures only, but <coughs> with a little bit of modification they can be adapted to other structures also. Is the point clear? An amplifier, an audio amplifier that you make hardly ever a, even a high quality stereo amplifier hardly ever goes to a 3 dB point of 20 kilohertz for example. 16 hertz to 16 kilohertz is okay, but there are people who can listen to more than 16 kilohertz and to them the if audio quality is important not the watts, not the loudness or the volume. Okay. If the quality is important, well uh, the this even the high quality stereo amplifier cannot go up to 20 kilohertz it stops somewhere at around 14 point something or so. Okay. A communication channel, a telephone channel for example, a telephone channel is a low pass channel that is very high frequencies cannot be transmitted. The telephone transmission line cuts off and so what happens is if you have all these can be treated as a network. A telephone line for example is a distributed network instead of a lump network it is a distributed network. Now, such networks therefore, most of the networks that you encounter in practice are low pass. So, if you fit this with a unit step, you do not get a unit step here. What you get although this is what you want for faithful transmission, well for faithful transmission what you want is the following that if this is the input, if this is the input then the output <coughs> that you want is something like this. It may not go to 1, it may not go to 1, maybe the final value is slightly less than 1 because of attenuation in the channel. But what you want is that this the shape of the input should be preserved, it should it would occur after a certain delay. Delay is a uh, fact of life you have to put up. Put up. So, this much is the delay, let us call this tau d. This is an ideal transmission channel, ideal transmission channel where I can tolerate a delay that is perfectly all right because uh, signals have to travel from one place to another be it a lump network or a distributed network it does require a certain amount of time. What we cannot tolerate is the distortion in the waveform. What you will see in practice will not be like this, what you will see is something like this. Maybe, maybe of overshoot and undershoot and oscillation. What you see in practice is something like this. Okay. Therefore, um, if the if the waveforms were not distorted, if there was no signal distortion, you would have said the delay introduced by the channel is tau d. Now, how do you define delay in such a case? How do you define delay in such a case? That is the that is a problem. Now, you know that in the laboratory you define delay as the time for the waveform to rise to 50 percent of its final value. This is a rule of thumb, there is nothing sacred about it, it could also be 70 percent for example. All right. Have you ever measured delay time in the laboratory? Oh, you must have in digital uh, in the digital electronics laboratory. Okay. So, what people say is uh, for example, if I, if I take a simple RC network and I, uh, I feed a unit step here, okay. then what I get is actually you do not you do not feed a unit step, you feed a pulse. Okay, and then look at the look at how the pulse rises. Okay, the, the pulse will rise like this. So if this is the final value, then you go to 50 percent and measure with the help of a CRO what is the time, and that that is what you call. As I said, there is nothing sacred about 50 percent. It could be 70 percent. For example, 
if 7 if let us say uh, the input voltage is 1 volt that is 1 volt step and 0.7 volt triggers a certain uh, logic circuit then what you would require is 70 percent delay okay 70 percent response and you will you will call that as the delay so there is nothing sacred about it number two it is okay in the laboratory to see on the oscilloscope and measure but suppose you want to design a circuit you are an electrical engineer and specifications have been given you want to design a circuit so you would like to know the effect of the elements of the circuit on the delay right in other words what you want is an analytical definition not an experimental definition like you go to the lab and measure on the CRO that means you have already made the system it is only under that condition that you can measure all right or maybe you simulate this on a computer a digital computer find its response <coughs> measure the response and if it is not satisfactory go back and change some of the designer this is an iterative procedure okay it, it might converge it may not converge and uh, a circuit may contain a, a number of elements let us say 20 elements which one would you change would you change one at a time or two at a time three it a, is a messy affair so what is required is an analytical definition if I can have an analytical definition then I should be able to judge how good a particular circuit is or how do I change this circuit so as to satisfy a certain prescribed requirement all right and this analytical definition was given by a gentleman by the name Elmore W Elmore in 1948 and this definition has become a standard definition the definition was used very sparingly till about uh, end of 70s very sparingly whenever <coughs> you require to design a circuit for a certain prescribed delay and as I am going to introduce the rise time and rise time well uh, Elmore definition used to be used but uh, <coughs> the advent of VLSI design and uh, design of integrated circuits that requires that these interconnections small interconnections that you make in the integrated circuit they act like transmission lines at very high frequencies they act like transmission lines, they cause a delay and therefore and it is a mess a VLSI uh, a typical VLSI may contain several tens of thousands of transistors and tens of thousands of interconnections how to get what the delay would be introduced and due to the delay what is the distortion all right so Elmore's definitions are uh, the the uh, oft quoted words from any VLSI designer and if you look at any VLSI design you will see there is a definition of delay there is an estimate a statistical estimate of what the delay could be how to change the delay and so on so the name Elmore has become very famous now and it is important that you understand what Elmore's definitions are now before we uh, take these definitions <coughs> I have uh, I have to tell you about two delays did I tell you earlier about phase delay and group delay did I no I did not yes, I thought I did but anyway a few minutes a few minutes suppose you have an ideal transmission channel ideal transmission channel then what would be its transfer function there is there is a certain amount of delay and there may be a certain amount of attenuation let us say h of is equal to k e to the minus s tau this is the transfer function you understand why this is the transfer function if v1 t is the input then the output output should be v1 some k times v1 t minus tau all that you require that the waveform should be preserved the shape of the waveform it may be reduced in magnitude or increased if it is an amplifier if there is an amplifier or a repeater in the channel it may be increased but what we want is that the shape of the waveform should be the same that is v1 t minus tau is simply a delayed version of v1 t okay and you can see that the transfer function of this Laplace of this divided by Laplace of this is simply equal to k e to the minus s tau okay so uh, the phase shift beta omega the phase shift of this is simply equal to minus omega tau and you see that tau has 
two significances here. Tau can be either looked upon as minus beta omega by omega or minus d beta omega d omega. That is you can either look upon this as minus beta omega by omega or the differential coefficient with a negative sign differential coefficient of the phase with respect to omega. So what is beta? Beta, beta omega is the phase shift of this transfer function obviously the magnitude is k and the phase shift is minus omega tau you put s equal to j omega so j omega tau ok. Now in this ideal channel ideal channel minus beta omega by omega and d beta omega by d omega they are the same they are the same and it is very easy to define the delay delay is tau it is very easy to measure the delay um, and uh, but this is not in general true because all channels in practice distort the signal that is the this is not k v1 t minus tau it is something different ok. It is not a step anymore if this is a step it goes like this and perhaps has oscillations also all right. So, these are in general different they are the same if the phase varies linearly with frequency. So, it is a linear phase system it was in that context that I had introduced these two terms. Now, if it is not linear phase then minus beta omega by omega is not the same as minus d beta omega d omega in general and this quantity minus beta omega by omega is called the phase delay tau p and it relates to a single frequency a single frequency omega. On the other hand the negative gradient of phase negative gradient of phase is called the group delay tau g and it relates to a small band of frequencies around omega. To calculate d beta d omega you require a small band of frequencies and therefore and no information can be transmitted without a band of frequencies a single frequency is absolutely worthless as far as information transmission is concerned. That means you cannot transmit information with zero bandwidth if it is a single frequency it's zero bandwidth you require a non zero bandwidth for transmission of information and this is why the bandwidth is so costly and there are CCITT regulations and all kinds of regulations on the bandwidth that can be used for television channel. If a new television channel is to be introduced in Delhi it cannot use any bandwidth that it likes it has to be regulated there is a regulatory mechanism all right that is a different story. So, we have two definitions of delay one is the phase delay one is the group delay and it is this delay that is of most practical importance. The group delay you shall also encounter perhaps you have already encountered in electro what is it electromagnetic theory or ele EM theory course ok all right. Then uh, the next point that uh, the next quantity that is of interest is the rise time ok rise time. I know that if I apply a unit step well the output output shall not be like this output will be like this let us say let us say it is like this ok. And I said that in the laboratory you define 50 percent of rise well it may go to unity it may not go to unity let us normalize the output response such that the final value is unity. So, you find out 50 percent and you call this as tau d the delay time and in the laboratory you measure the rise time that is 50 percent delay time only measures when the waveform goes to 50 percent of the final value. But if you wanted an integrated view of the waveform how fast does it rise well what you do is you go to point 1 and point 9 and measure the difference that is 10 percent to 90 percent this is called the rise time tau r ok. It is meaningful it is meaningful only if there are not violent oscillations is not that right. It is meaningful strictly it is meaningful for monotonic 
step response monotonic that is if there are no oscillations. But a small amount of overshoot and a small amount of undershoot the practical figure is 5 percent if the overshoot or undershoot is less than 5 percent well the rise time is taken to be a meaningful quantity. We have again the same problem with regard to the rise time. If we can simply measure it by a definition an arbitrarily adapted definition one can ask why not 9 to 99 or 1 to 99 well perfectly all right you can adopt any definition. This is what uh, people usually use in industry 10 percent to 90 percent. But as I said if you are a circuit designer then this definition is useless because you do not know you do not know how to design the circuit such that a particular 10 percent to 90 percent rise time is met. So, you want an analytical definition and once again it was Elmore in the same paper journal of applied physics in 1948 he gave a definition of rise time which has now become a standard an analytical definition. So, when you say that it is 5 percent or 10 percent or 90 percent it is of the input maximum or the output maximum? Output maximum that is what I said that output may not rise to 1 it may rise to 0.8 then you normalize this 0.8 to 1 ok that means 90 percent of 0 0.8 0 0.72 or whatever it is ok. So, we do require a definition of rise time and L analytical definition and this was given by Elmore. Now hardly ever in practice you can generate a unit step what you generate in the laboratory is a pulse which looks like this on the oscilloscope, but if you zoom that is if you expand the time base you will see that what you see as a square wave or a pulse is really something like this something like this if you expand on the oscilloscope if you zoom all right therefore the input pulse also has a rise time the input that you apply here let us say let us say the rise time is T R I I the input rise time the output rise time is tau r 0. Now, what can you say about the relative values of these two? Which one is bigger? Obviously, because the network causes further distortion of the signal. Now, if tau r 0 and tau r i these two quantities are known we will show later that the network rise time tau r n can be determined by a very simple formula which we shall find later. Uh, before we go further let us take a simple example of the uh, RC network RC network simple low pass RC network and most of the channels most of the communication channels in practice can be uh, modeled by a simple RC network. Now you know that if the input is a unit step V i t if the input is a unit step V i t is equal to u t then you know that V 0 t for this network is simply 1 minus e to the minus t by r c multiplied by u t this you of course know all right it rises monotonically like this and it does indeed go to the value 1 when t goes to infinity all right. Now obviously the 50 percent delay time is obtained by making 0 0.5 equal to e to the minus t 50 divided by r c ok. You can find out t 50 from here all right. If you want to find the rise time by using the usual definition then what you do is you write 0 0.9 equal to 1 minus e to the minus t 0 0.9 by r c t point 0.9 is a, is, a, is a constant and the other one is point 0.1 equal to 1 minus e to the minus t point 0.1 by r c. And if you solve this then t point 0.9 is approximately equal to 2.3 approximately and t point 0.1 is approximately equal to point 0.1. So, that the rise time tau r for the simple r c network is equal to 2.2 I have made a mistake here R C ok I must multiply by R C. So, it is 2.2 R C the rise time is approximately 2.2 R C 
okay most of the communication channels can be modeled roughly by a simple RC network like this. So, this figure is also a very secret figure 2.2 RC. You also know that in the, the frequency response h of j omega magnitude it starts from 1 and then goes to 0 as omega goes to infinity for this simple low pass filter and you know that if this is 1 the 3 dB point or 0 0.707 is reached when omega equal to 1 over RC and this we take as the bandwidth of the RC network right. Bandwidth is equal to 1 over RC and you notice that tau r multiplied by bandwidth this bandwidth is in radians per second this is in radians omega you see that this is equal to 2.2 a constant. All right, for the RC network. You change the values of R and C, it does not matter. The product of tau R and bandwidth is a constant. Uh, <coughs> in communication system practice, one uses the hard frequency in bandwidth, that is, one says the bandwidth in hard instead of instead of radians. So, this would be 2.2 divided by 2 pi. Two pi and this is approximately equal to 0.35 and this figure should be remembered at all costs. You see the uh, rise time and uh, 3 dB bandwidth in hertz the product is a constant 0.35 and in most of the low pass situations whether it is a telephone channel or any other kind of channel uh, the this figure 0.35 is a very sacred figure. It, it can deviate 0 0.349 or 0 0.352 or some, but it is around 0 0.35 and the simple RC network therefore models and this, uh, this shows this shows a certain kind of uncertainty principle. This is a reflection of the well known uncertainty principle. It says that you cannot have the what is it called cake and eat it too it is that kind of a. Okay, that is what it says. It says that you cannot improve things in the time domain as well as in the frequency domain. That is you if you increase the bandwidth then your rise time shall be smaller. If you decrease the bandwidth the rise time would be higher. That is the narrower the bandwidth that you use okay, for better resolution the higher will be the rise time. All right. You cannot improve things in the time domain as well as the frequent. There are many other uh, political uh, analogies of this, but uh, I will not go into this. So the rise time is going to be shorter. Yeah. So isn't that good, sir? Isn't that good? Yes, sir. So it increases Expensive. Cost. <laughs> the cost. One would not like to use a large bandwidth because it is very costly. One would like to use as narrow a bandwidth as possible. Okay and therefore the rise time suffers. All right, uh, now we come to Elmore's definition. <coughs> Suppose you have a network N whose input is V1 T which is a UT and suppose the output is V 2 T okay. and as I said the network could be such that V 2 T does not rise to the value 1 even if the input is U of T. So, we talk in terms of not V 2 T, but V 2 T is normalized with respect to V 2 of infinity all right. This we call as V 2 N T v 2 and t normalized output response obviously obviously v 2 and infinity is equal to pardon me 1 and v 2 and 0 0 okay you understand this we simply normalize this whatever v 2 infinity is we will call this uh, we will normalize this with respect to V2 infinity so that V2n the normalized value goes to 1. Now, <coughs> if V2n 
T is the unit step response, then obviously if I differentiate this with respect to T, this would be the unit impulse response that is H N of T, normalized unit impulse response, okay. Is that clear? The differential coefficient of the unit step response, this is signals and systems because the inputs are uh, related by differentiation, output should also be related by differentiation. We are talking of a linear system. If the input is differentiated, yeah. V2n is the output. V2n is the output, normalized output and its differential coefficient shall be the unit impulse response. Again normalized, normalized, okay. Now therefore, if V2 N T is of this shape, let us say it is of this shape, then H N of T, the unit impulse response, we are talking of all normalized values, this would obviously be a bell shaped curve, is not it? Maximum slope would be reached somewhere here, then the slope goes to 0 here, monotonically the slope is 0 here also. So, oh, I have not shown it correctly, it, it is like this, it starts with a 0 slope. So, you get an impulse response like this, agreed? What is the area under the curve? Integral 0 to infinity h n t d t, 1, why? Because this is v 2 n infinity minus v 2 n 0 which is equal to 1, is that clear? So, the area under the curve is 1, all right. Now, how do you find the 50 percent rise time? Obviously, 50 percent rise time would be 0 to T 50, let us say H n T d T should be equal to how much? Come on, this is not a difficult question. This is half, that is right, it is equal to 0 0.5. So, what is T50 then? T50 obviously is a value of time such that the area on the left hand side and the area on the right hand side are equal, is not that right? The 50 percent delay time therefore divides the area under the normalized unit impulse response into two equal halves and this was the point at which Elmore said, oh I can give now a very beautiful analytical definition. Yes. Sir. yes. So, this need not be at the peak, the T50? No, it need not be at the peak because this is, this goes up to infinity. So, it, it may be slightly further away, but it give it gives a clue. To Elmore's definition. This was this is what inspired Elmore to define uh, <coughs> delay time instead of 50 percent delay time as the centroid of this curve. So, how can we say that the area until time t 50? Oh, because this is equal to V 2 n t 50 minus, minus V 2 n 0, all right, and this is equal to 0.5. So, the area under the curve is halved, all right. So, Elmore said instead of taking the 50 percent which is a uh, rule of thumb, why do not we take the centroid of the bell shaped curve. In other words, he defines tau d as equal to integral 0 to infinity, how do you define the centroid? First moment that is T h n t t d t divided by normalize this with respect to h n t d t. This is the definition of Elmore. You understand the logic or the motivation. Logic is 50 t 50 divides the uh, divides it into two equal halves. So, instead of doing that we take the centroid. Sir, 0 to infinity, pardon me? 0 to infinity. We take the centroid of the curve as the time delay, okay. But you know that this is equal to 1 and therefore, tau d is simply equal to 0 to infinity T h n T d T. Agreed? This is the definition of Elmore and then Elmore found once he obtained this, he found that tau d is very simply related to the frequency domain. This is a time domain definition. 
you want you, you have to find out the normalized unit impulse response multiply by t take the area under the curve okay, from 0 to infinity. Now he showed that this is very simply related to the transfer function. Okay. Now you know that uh, hnt if hnt is the normalized unit impulse response then the normalized transfer function would be simply the Laplace transform of h n of t is that okay? Laplace transform of h n of t that means it is equal to 0 to infinity h n of t e to the minus s t d t agreed. Oh, V to n t is the normalized unit step response and therefore its differential coefficient will be normalized unit impulse response because step and impulse are related by one is the differentiation of the other and since it is a linear system if the input is differentiated the output will also be differentiated as simple as that. All right. Now this is a million dollar equation because if you differentiate h n s with respect to s with respect to s not t this integral is with respect to t. So you can differentiate inside the integral because s as far as the integration is concerned is a constant but you can differentiate and you can see that if you take a negative sign here that it is simply 0 to infinity t h n t e to the minus s t d t okay? and then you put s equal to 0. You put s equal to 0 so this term e to the minus s t this goes to 1 and this becomes exactly equal to tau d is not that right. So given a transfer function you do not have to go back to the time domain to find tau d you can find it in the frequency domain itself all that you do is uh, differentiate the transfer function with respect to s and put s equal to 0. Now a question arises if the transfer function h of s is given actual transfer function how do you find the h n of s how do you find the normalized transfer function maximum value, maximum value no how do you know the maximum value pardon me final value theorem what is the final value theorem v2 infinity is equal to limit s tend to 0 s h of s correct now what is h of s what is h of s you remember what was what is v2 of s it is the unit step response so if you divide by s that would be h of s okay so if you multiply this you get v2 infinity that is the final value theorem and don't you see that this is simply equal to pardon me no i made a mistake here limit s times v2 s i made a mistake here and this is limit s tend to 0 what is v2 s v2 s is obviously h of s by s and therefore this is equal to h of 0 all right all that we have done so far is to normalize with respect to v2 infinity v2 infinity is a constant and this is exactly equal to h of 0 and therefore our h n of s would be equal to h of s divided by h of 0 that is it extremely simple you do not have to do the Laplace inversion you do not have to go to the time domain given the transfer function you divide by its dc value that is the normalized transfer function and then you differentiate this with respect to s and put s equal to 0. Let me write it again tau d is equal to minus d h n s divided by d s s equal to 0 h n s is equal to h of s divided by h of 0 all right now isn't it clear that you can also write this as minus d h n instead of s 
if you put j omega then d j omega so I can write this as j d omega j is a constant at omega equal to 0. In some cases this is more appropriate to use than this function all right. For example if you have let us say a an all pass network you know in an all pass network the transfer function magnitude is a constant and the phase varies with frequency okay. If it is all pass then what would be the normalized transfer function h n of s what would be the form of this yeah e to the power e to the power j beta omega the magnitude would be 1 because you have normalized. So, this would be the form and you can show you can show by applying this definition that tau d can be written as <coughs> this algebra I leave out tau d can be written as beta prime 0 e to the power j beta 0. Have patience for one more minute then a very interesting result comes out. What is beta 0? What is the DC value of beta? Zero. Pardon me? Zero. Why? Your answer is correct, but why? Because beta omega phase is a odd function and therefore at omega equal to 0 it must be 0. Therefore, this is 1 which means that tau d is d beta omega. I have made a mistake. Can you tell me why the mistake is? I should have taken a negative sign here. Yes or no? E to the power j beta omega. No, 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 no. Wait a second. Hmm. Perfectly all right. There is a minus sign here because of this minus sign. Okay. Because of this minus sign, there is a minus sign here. So, this is minus d beta omega d omega at omega equal to 0. All right. Let me write it again tau sub d comes as minus beta prime 0 which means minus d beta omega d omega at omega equal to 0. What is this? What is this quantity? No, j will cancel out. This is the group delay and therefore, this is tau g 0 all right and this is another strong uh, motivation for Elmore's using Elmore's definition. The Elmore's definition has a physical significance. It is the group delay at DC. It is the group delay at DC. So, tau d has several interpretations. It is minus d h n s d s at s equal to 0. Tau d is the centroid of the unit impulse response curve. Tau d is also equal to the group delay at DC and this is where we shall start from in the last lecture. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>